Welcome back, everybody, to Toronto Today here on The Parlay. I'm your host, Luca Rosano, alongside my co-host, Michael Singh. And we are back on this Monday. It is the Monday after Super Bowl Sunday. And we got a lot to talk about on today's show. So we're just going to get right into it. And we're going to start with the big game, of course. The Rams are your Super Bowl champions. The Los Angeles Rams defeat the Bengals in the big game. It was a nitty-gritty, nail-biting type of game that came down the wire. And the Rams made a stop in fourth and one to clinch the Super Bowl in front of their home crowd. So before we get into some interesting props that we may have bet on, what were your overall thoughts, Mike, on on the game? And what were your thoughts on that halftime show that had everybody talking on social media? Halftime show was amazing. Uh, I don't know if it's because I guess we're we're old now or <laughs> what it was, but that that spoke to me, took me back to a couple years ago, of course, when when that vibe was around and. I thought they killed it. I, I didn't want that to end. Um, there were some interesting prop bets on the halftime show, which we can actually get into shortly, that I threw some money on. But overall, the game itself was was really good game. I mean, it's what you can ask for in a Super Bowl. It came down to essentially the last possession, and uh, obviously the Rams came away with the game. But I, I really enjoyed it, and I, I think overall, though, this whole postseason was a really good postseason for the NFL. Like It got a lot of fans into it, and especially with the sports betting being legalized now in Canada, I found a lot more casual fans who typically don't watch football. They, I saw them betting. Like I had, I had friends of mine that were just throwing money down because of some of the, the fun prop bets that come with the Super Bowl. So it was a, it was a good experience, a good Sunday uh, evening. And, you know, I had some good food and overall just a, a good day. Yeah, it was a good game. You couldn't have asked for a better game, in my opinion. And it's funny, after uh, the Super Wild Card weekend, all of these games essentially came down to one score games, final drive games. And this was another example of that. My Super Bowl could have been a lot better, as I was telling you uh, off air, Mike. I almost hit a pretty nice parlay. So I actually parlayed the two NBA games, which I got right. I took Celtics, I think it was minus seven and a half. They won by 10. And T-Wolves minus six and a half. They won by nine against the Pacers. And then I took Bengals plus four and a half. They obviously covered. They only lost by three. But what got me was that over under. I put over 48 and a half and it was looking over, especially when Burrow threw that bomb to begin the second half. But then the defenses came alive. And then even on that last drive, if the Bengals got into field goal range, they tied it up to bring that game into overtime. The over would have hit in overtime. So I was upset. I always lose on over unders. It, it, it drains me every year, but I still do it. So that was kind of the... Uh, the gloom to my Super Bowl Sunday. But other than that, it was a really good game. Had a great time, had some good food. And yeah, let's get into some crazy props. Before we get into some of the props that you bet on, I'll be honest, I didn't really do any prop bets. The only betting I did was that parlay that I lost. But I do want to highlight one crazy prop bet that Drake actually did. So he yeah. obviously has a ton of money, so he can just put whatever he wants on these prop bets, not caring if it wins or loses. But this one that he did actually won. He won $850,000 on Odo Beckham Jr. scoring the first touchdown. And I actually really like this player prop. I didn't do it myself, but I talked about it last week in the NFL show that we did. And it came, it came through. It was great to see Odell start the game off with a TD. And Drake, I mean, he didn't really need the money, but he became richer after that win. <laughs> well, I think it's it was actually some genius marketing. Um, the company, I believe, that... that Drake was screenshotting and posting his his bets. I think it was called Stake. And my guess is that they give him that money to tell him, hey, go go throw a ridiculous amount of money down. Just put it on your social medias and we'll cover that bet for you. Because now everybody's kind of talking about what Drake bet on. And of course, you see the company sublim subliminally in, in the background. So I think it's kind of genius marketing by that company. Obviously, they'll probably make up more than that money just on, on people betting on their sports books. So um, I got to commend them for that. And, and that Drake, a um, couple of Drake bets, he hit two out of three. Um, yeah. The one that he didn't hit, I kind of feel him because I put some money down on Odell Beckham Jr. Getting a touchdown and having at least 100 receiving yards. And the odds are pretty ridiculous for that. It was like plus 800. Um, and he was on track to do that. And 
you know, before he went down injured in the first yeah. half, he had 52 receiving yards. He was looking dangerous, obviously, with Cooper Cup on the other side. Um, he was finding himself in, in just isolation quite often, and he made the most of it until he went down. I mean, if he, he picked up that pass and ca- caught that ball, he might have picked up a few extra yards. But it's funny because Drake needed 10 more yards for OBJ. I needed about 50, so it wasn't like too bad. But he needed just 10 more. And of course, OBJ went down for the rest of the game and cost Drake $500,000. But <laughs> let's get real. Nobody is, uh, nobody's feeling bad for, for Drake this morning. Now, circling to some of the wildest like Super Bowl prop bets, there were some funny ones. So let's start with the halftime show. Um, one of them was would Snoop Dogg smoke on stage? Uh, and it was in California. And obviously, we know Snoop Dogg's brand most people were saying yes for that one yeah i did I, I was thinking that right it's just that that's who he is and he actually did not end up doing it but i saw a tmz article this morning or a new york post article that said he did so right before he went on stage mm, that so makes sense. that almost came through also another one was eminem's halftime performance would some of it be censored it wasn't because all he did was uh, it was lose yourself. The one song, there's no sort of profanity in there, and so it wasn't really censored. Um, there, some other fun ones. Gatorade color, it ended up being blue, which actually would have hit, I think, plus four hundred if you did guess blue. And it makes sense because the Rams are yeah. obviously that's their color, right? Yeah. I think if the Bengals won, we'd be we'd be talking about an orange Gatorade celebration. So. That was uh, another fun, interesting one. Um, coin flip, of course. Another one was... Uh, the anthem was good. The anthem, yeah. I think it just hit I, over. I, it, yeah, and I bet on actually who would be shown first during the anthem, Matt Stafford or Joe Burrow, which is an interesting one you could do on the NBC broadcast, and it ended up being Joe Burrow, actually. I don't even yeah. think they showed Matt Stafford much. <laughs> during the pregame so that was pretty wild considering the game that he went on to to have for for the rams there and his storyline heading into this one as well but joe burrow was uh the guy stealing all the spotlight and my biggest uh loss was uh betting on the Bengals. i just took them straight up to win i saw i liked the odds and i was just like if i'm gonna do this let me just root for him um but obviously they came up short even though they carried the lead with uh Less than two minutes to go, man. Yeah. They, it was so close. But overall, yeah, I think it was just a really fun Super Bowl. And I love those prop bets. You can get really uh, unique with them. Yeah, you could. And uh, I did get greedy, too, on another bet that I did. I just took the Bengals' money line. But obviously, that, that didn't come through. And at the end, when the Rams were on that drive, a lot of flags that people were losing their minds over mm-hmm. extending that drive. But this is what I'll say in closing about this game. The best team on paper did end up winning. The super team that came to be for this season, it was labeled Super Bowl or bust, and they got it done. It's unfortunate that the Bengals couldn't get it done. I know a lot of people were rooting for Joe Burrow, and that's one of the reasons why he was the first QB shown. I mean, everybody was getting on the Joe Burrow hype train. The media was just glorifying this guy, and rightfully so. He's the next big thing, I think, in the NFL. Great young talent, but at the end, it was the better team that won. I just feel for Bengals fans because they were so close when they had that lead late in the game and the Rams were driving and they were having a tough time going down against that defense, I thought the Bengals had it. And then Stafford to Cup, the rest is history. And then their defense, credit their defense, they made a great stop on fourth and one. I thought the Bengals were at least going to pick up one yard and they got to Burrow. They got to help Burrow this offseason. That O-line, they tormented him all postseason long. I think he ended up being the most sacked quarterback in the Super Bowl or at least tied that mark and this was a couple weeks after that he got sacked like 10 times against the Titans so they got to do a better job protecting Burrow if they want to extend his shelf life in the NFL but hopefully the Bengals with Burrow will be back in the big game I actually took because of the the Rams uh, crazy defensive line I actually took Burrow to have over 11 and a half rushing yards because I thought they'd make him scramble a little bit more than they did um but obviously that didn't hit because every time he tried to run they just swarmed him and Aaron Donald was an absolute machine in that game he played such a big role and they definitely need to get Jerbro help some help I I read a stat where he was the third most sacked 
quarterback of all time this year. Yeah, he crazy. got sacked 70 times. And the fact that they were leading the Super Bowl with less than two minutes left, despite that stat, that's that's a shout out to how good Joe Burrow and some of his receivers were this season. So and the running game was really good for the Bengals. But yeah, overall, just uh, it was a great game. We're gonna miss the NFL, man. It's gonna it's gonna be a long off season, but it should be an exciting one. As uh, the Rams, Super Bowl champions, happy for D- uh, Donald and uh, Stafford. I mean, all those years in Detroit, losing seasons, he can finally call himself a Super Bowl champion. All right, we could talk about the Super Bowl for the next thirty minutes, but we will get on to some other programming here. We're now gonna talk about the Toronto Raptors as they saw their winning streak come to an end, and it looked like they were gonna pull it out again. I mean. When they were down by four and Fred Van Vliet hit that three and then Jokic chokes at the line on the other end, I'm like, here we go. The Raptors are going to pull it off again. It's going to have everybody talking and this team is going to extend their winning streak. But credit to Jokic, man. Oh my goodness. OG, I'm sorry. He got absolutely blocked. That was an incredible display of Jokic. I don't think I've ever seen Jokic react that quickly and look that athletic on a block as he quickly just switched his body, (laughs) turned to OG and and blocked him. Like that was a mean block to end the game as Jokic did dominate inside in this game. He had 28, 15 and six and the game winning block. And the Raptors were out rebounded in this one, Mike 50 to 35. Of course, this overshadowed what was another superstar type performance from Siakam. He was a uh, dynamite in this game. OG struggled. Gary Trent Jr. struggled. And the last thing I'll mention here is something that everybody was talking after this one, the officiating. The officiating was clearly one-sided. And what was mind-boggling to me was at the end of this game, when you looked at Siakam's stat line, to see that he did not get to the free throw line once, that's pretty bad. And a lot of fans were recognizing that. I don't know if you saw that clip that went viral after of Nick Nurse melting to the referees. I don't know what he said, but read lips if you can. They were clearly upset with the officiating all night long. But I think my biggest takeaway from this game, outside of the officiating, which is the obvious, it's kind of what we talked about last week, Mike, about the Raptors are going to have trouble when they take on these big centers these these big guys in the middle now granted there's nobody in the nba that can stop Jokic and an mb straight up they're just playing on an absolute epic level right now but we see when the raptors do go up against a big bad enforcer a big man who can go off they're gonna they're gonna have their uh their struggles and we're gonna see the same thing happen when they go up against a better team in the sixers and arguably a better big at the time, as of right now, in Joel Embiid. So we'll see how the Raptors adjust to that matchup when it comes. Yeah, my thoughts exactly kind of summed up everything I was sort of going to say there. Um, OG Ananobi, that summed up his night as well, uh, that Jokic block, because OG really struggled. And I think he's been the one guy who, you know, come the start of the season, we're all expecting a little bit more from. I know he's battled some injury, but he has the potential to be a a star in this league. And obviously it's tough when you have the performances that Fred Van Vliet, Gary Trent Jr., Pascal Siakam are having. It's tough to just get your your natural touches and get your flow in the game. But he he did struggle a lot uh, against Denver. And as you mentioned, Jokic inside, that was that was money for Denver. That being said, a game winning streak comes to an end, but it, it was it was a one point game. Like yeah. when all's said and done, like the Raptors had that game in the bag. I would argue they probably lost that game as opposed to Denver winning it. Although Denver did hit some really big shots, but the Raptors were what? 11 of 17 from the free throw line, just 66%, something like that. Just not good enough there um, at the charity strike. And when it's a tight game, like, like they are like against Denver, who by the way, was coming off a second night of a back to back after losing to Boston that's uh that stuff comes back to bite you. So I think that's what happened overall with the Raptors and who knows, like this will probably just be a, a small bump in the road because I'm looking at their schedule and I know they go again tonight. I I like their schedule. So I think they can string together and bounce back and pick up a couple uh victories along the way to get them back on track. Yeah, that's a good point. For as dominant as Jokic was this was a very winnable game. The Raptors only lost it by one. And you're right. I mean, in that fourth quarter, I believe they did have the lead and you got to credit the Nuggets for making some big time shots, but 
the Raptors had that game in the palm of their hands. If it wasn't for guys missing key shots later, them not making their free throws, this could have been another sound victory at home against the Denver Nuggets. And uh, yeah, you look ahead to the Raptors schedule this week before they get into the uh, all-star break. They're going to have a very winnable game tonight, which we're about to get to against the Pelicans. And then they're going to have an interesting game against the T-Wolves, who, of course, have been playing some great basketball lately. But both these games are definitely winnable, as uh, we will get into that game tonight against the Pelicans. And the spread is surprisingly only minus four and a half. Are you surprised that the spread is this low? The Raptors will be taking on a Pelicans team that has lost two in a row. This is a team that are fighting for their lives to try to make that play in. CJ McCollum is coming off a big time performance, but the Raptors still should be okay in the spot. Or are you thinking otherwise? No, I'm I'm surprised that the spread is is just minus four and a half with the Raptors at home against New Orleans. New Orleans got blown out by Miami, like absolutely blown out. And then they lost to the Spurs, who I mean, the Spurs aren't that great either. They they lost by 10. So with the spread only minus four and a half, with the way the Raptors have been playing overall, I know that they're going to be hungry to bounce back against a Pelicans team who might be prone to, you know, a, another drubbing. I think I like the Raptors a lot in this spot. They've covered the spread in 16 of their last 20 games after losing as favorites. So when the Raptors kind of have a little bit of an off night, they typically bounce back in convincing fashion. I think that's what's going to happen uh Tonight at Scotiabank Arena, or I guess it's not at Scotiabank, eh? It's no, it's in, on the it's road, in New Orleans. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so they're on the road. Um, but still, I still like the Raptors there. I mean, the Pelicans, I don't believe that they're that great. They're still trying to work in CJ. Um, and I know JV likes playing against the Raptors, but I still think the Raptors are going to show up and, and uh, cover that spread. Yeah, I was trying to look for some some trends um but yeah it's been it's been a series that's been pretty dominated by the raptors 26 wins to the pelicans 16 so i'm very surprised of the number maybe that it is a road game and the pelicans prior to them losing two in a row they did start to turn that ship around slowly they bring in mccollum who did have 35 the other night but yeah i agree with you mike this should be a game where the raptors win i'm not gonna say dominate i think it will be ultimately a close game but I think the Raptors should be able to win this game. And it's going to be important for them. We keep saying how they want to get into the all-star break on a high. You just go on this massive win streak. Let's see if you can win these two games or at least split them going into the weekend. So, yeah, I do like the Raptors in this spot. But I, I think I'm going to stay away. I mean, I'm not like confident enough to bet on it. But the Raptors should win tonight. But I'm thinking more along the lines that it's a close game. So that's why maybe that four and a half could intimidate me a bit i mean we've seen with the raptors man like this is a team that's played in a ton of close games i know they've had some nice dominating performances against teams like you know the rockets and the thunder but those teams stink they're the bottom of the uh <laughs> you know the, the league but when they take on teams like the pelicans like the nuggets i don't know they t they tend to keep those games close so i could see the raptors win but it'll be another dramatic dramatic type finish at the end that, that's what i see tonight yeah, they seem like they're the type of team who kind of plays down to the level of their competition or up to the level of their competition. And I'm not saying the Pelicans are horrible, but I'm, I'm not convinced at all by the Pelicans. I know they made some moves to improve their team, but I still think they have some kinks to work out there. And, and the Raptors, on the other hand, they're playing some of the best basketball in the NBA despite coming off that one-point loss to Denver. I mean, like we keep saying, it was just a one-point loss. So yeah. I think they'll kind of keep that momentum going. and. For me, I'm I'm confident in, in taking the spread. The Raptors are one of the best teams in the NBA at covering the spread. I think they're the fourth best team in the league. And let's see if they can uh, continue that momentum and keep that going tonight. So producer Robbie just informed us that the line has actually moved down to three and a half. So that uh, means people are betting on the uh, the Pelicans. Some money's coming in on the Pelicans. So minus three and a half, that's, that's pretty intriguing. So it did go down a full point. I like it. That bodes better for better for my bet already. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, switching gears now to another team that's in need of a win. Um, we're going to talk about the Maple Leafs now. They uh, lost again on uh, Saturday night, and that was a game that you were going to have a close eye on, just based on how they lost their previous game against the Flames. 
And the Leeds goaltending, I mean, it hasn't been the sharpest over the last 10 games, but what were your overall takeaways from that uh, defeat again on Saturday against the Canucks? Well, two things. One, the Leafs actually played really, really well. I think they, they had 53 shots on net as opposed to Vancouver's 29. And it took Thatcher Demko standing on his head for the Canucks to for the Leafs to, to come out with a loss there for the Canucks to pick up the win. He made 51 saves for Vancouver. That was a new career high for the goalie. And I think that's what it was. He just ran into a hot goaltender. The Leafs did. And uh, Sheldon Keefe said after the game that goaltending was the difference in this game. Now, for me, that's kind of a, okay, I tip my hat to what the Canucks did and, and what Thatcher Demko did in net, but also a little bit of a, a, a jab at your own goaltenders there in, in Jack Campbell and uh, Peter Mrazek, who over the last 10 games, they have a sub 900 save percentage, which is not going to help you win hockey games no matter how good your team is. Because when you have a game like this in which you dominate, and you go behind early on some questionable goals, then it it really makes it tough for your team to win. And when you go behind two nothing early in a game and against a team like Vancouver who relies on some steady goaltending, it's going to be tough for to win. And I think even the Canucks players after the game said it didn't really matter how they got the result. The fact was that they just got the result. So. Again, my takeaways are I like the way the Leafs played, but goaltending is still starting to become a, a concern for me for this team. Yeah, that's going to be, I think, the ongoing uh, storyline with this team as uh, we move along here into the second half of the season. How is this goaltending going to hold up as the Leafs do get into the postseason? That's going to be something that everybody's going to be looking at very closely down the stretch. The Leafs are going to be uh, catching a little bit of a break tonight as they take on a, a pretty bad Kraken team. Uh, 1624. Uh, sorry, 1628 and four on the season, and the Leafs, of course, are big favorites here. Do you see any letdown spots, or should the Leafs take care of business? Well, they're coming off consecutive games in regulation uh, where they lost for the first time since October. So the trend would tell you that they sh they should keep going. Like, there's no reason why they can't. Uh, pick up a win here today against sorry i mean like they can't pick up a win here today against the seattle kraken they're minus 200 on the money line on the puck line they're plus 105 and the kraken as you mentioned they're not very good they've lost three of the last five i believe this is the first time the least will actually be seeing the seattle kraken yeah. which is very which is very interesting because you never know how two teams kind of match up against each other but the one thing that I guess I have trouble with is you're only going to find value on the Leafs on the puck line here. Yeah. But they're the fifth worst team in the league at covering them on the puck line. Surprisingly, because the Leafs are, they have such a high octane offense and their defense hasn't been too bad this season. So that was a concern until I looked at the Seattle Kraken and the Seattle Kraken are the fourth worst in the league at covering the puck line. Meaning, especially as they come in as, as mainly underdogs in their first year in the league, They've lost a lot of games by more than two goals. And with the Leafs needing a statement game to kind of get back on track here, I do like the Leafs here in this spot. But one bet I kind of like a little bit more is the over-under tonight. I'm typically not someone who likes to bet on over-unders, which is set at six goals in this one. But these are two teams who combined, they typically hit that over more so than not. They're both in the top 10 in terms of the over percentage in in the league, meaning their most of their games do go over. And with the Leafs goaltending trending the way it is, their offense is clicking on, especially on the power play, as they also had two power play goals on Saturday night. I like the over in this spot. I think six goals will be pretty easy mark for both teams to hit combined there. So I'd say smash that over. I think it's coming in at minus 120 right now. Um, but I, I just, I don't see the crack and be the Leafs overall. Yeah, I don't either. I think this is where you could get creative. Maybe parlay Leafs puck line and the over throw some money on that. That'd be pretty good. Cause yeah, I think, uh, you know, just taking them on the money, money line, there's not great value there. I, I don't see a situation where the Kraken win. And like you said, uh, the Kraken haven't been a, a good hockey team in terms of keeping games close. 
So I could see this just being a bounce back spot overall for the Leafs coming off two defeats. They're angry. They're pissed off. This could just be a, a clinical performance by everybody, their players, their goaltending. So I do like the Leafs big tonight. We'll see if they can get back in the win column against the Seattle Kraken. We'll be seeing them for the first time. All right. We got some tennis news now to get to. Felix Aliassim. How about him, man? ATP singles champion, milestone win in Rotterdam. He upset it. Um, I think you should say this name because you're better with tennis <laughs> names than I am, to be honest. It, it's Sissipas. So Stefano Sissipas. Sissipas. Uh, very good player. And Oji Aliassim got the better of him. 6 4, 6 2. It was a dominant performance where Aliassim, the whole match, Luca, he didn't face a break point. And yeah. He broke Sissipas three times. So as you mentioned, it's his first title. I'm happy for him there. Yeah, I mean, it was a pretty dominant victory. And uh, now you see Ali Seem, he's building momentum now uh, towards the French Open, which is in May. He'll be here in no time. So I like this, you know, win for his career. He, he finally knows what it feels to win, uh, you know, first ATP championship. And I think this is only going to do wonders for him. So yeah, shout out to the Canadian. He gets a big time win under his... Uh, his, you know, his belt looks good on the resume. And let's see if he can have uh, a longer run in the next uh, major. And hopefully he can be that dark horse to uh, potentially make some noise at the French Open. Yeah. And I like how you mentioned it steps forward because he's coming off that really impressive run at the Australian Open where he took Medvedev to five sets, if you recall. And... This one, he, he took the step forward because he got the monkey off his back prior to, I guess, Sunday. The 21-year-old, he lost his previous eight finals dating back to 2019. So he got that monkey off his back. He got over the hump, and he took a step forward. Now we talk about the French Open in May. Can he take another step forward there? And I like it. I do. I like Alger Aliassim, especially because he's probably not going to be coming in at great value. It's it's going to be... You, you could find a, a bet there where Aliassim makes a run at, at the French Open. I think his style of play kind of fits that type of game there at Roland Garros too. So keep an eye on he, how he does uh, leading up to May. And there's a lot of tournaments between now and then. So let's see if he continues to make a lot of noise. I mean, I don't want to look too ahead here, but yeah, that French Open, I think it's going to come down to who you take in Nadal or the field. Nadal's been obviously dominant with the French Open. But yeah, I mean, if Ali Asim can make a run, potentially get to a quarters, a semis, I would not rule that out. Obviously, a lot of time between now and then. then and like you said, there's a lot more uh, tournaments coming up so he can fine-tune fine -tune himself for uh, the next tournament. And yeah, hopefully he has his best one yet. So again, congratulations to the Canadian and uh, big things. Coming for sure. All right, let's get to our best bet here to close out uh, what has been a very long but detailed show. We got uh, we covered a lot of ground, I feel. But now let's give the people some winners, Mike. You are 15 and 10. Got to give you some credit. You are hanging around with my uh, pretty lengthy win streak. I, I'll be honest. I'm, I don't know how I've been able to muster up these many wins <laughs> in a row. But before we get into my winner, what do you got for us tonight? Yeah, so... First, before we get into our best bets, actually, just some breaking news here. I just want to touch on quickly. We talked about it last show, so we won't go into it too much. And that's that Josie Altador has officially been bought out by Toronto FC. The end of an era. Just a quick quote from TFC President Bill Manning. Uh, we want to thank Josie for all of his contributions to Toronto FC over the last seven seasons. He scored some of the most important and memorable, goal memorable goals during the most successful period in our club history. We wish Josie well in this next chapter of his career. His place in TF TFC history is secure, and our fans will never forget the moments he produced. That pretty much sums up uh, what we were saying there last week, Luca. So um, I think we all know what the sentiment around Josie Altador is, and I believe he has been signed officially now by the New England Revolution. So circle August 17th on your calendar, it will uh, it'll be a special day at BMO Field. But moving on now to our best bet. I'm going to be taking the Toronto Raptors tonight, Luca. 
I liked how that spread moved down, minus three and a half. They're on the road against New Orleans, but the Raptors have been playing some of the best basketball in the NBA. I think they'll cover that spread, so take the Raptors there at minus three and a half. Yeah, I love how the uh, the line went down live on air as uh, it just, uh, I feel like it, it made you w- want to take them even more. So I I, I do like that. I, I, think, uh, I think it still will be a close game, but I mean, three and a half. Yeah, you know, they they get a couple of late free throws. Hopefully they make it and they cover that number. So I can see that being a winner. Um, but for mine, I'm going to go with a different game in the association. I'm going to go with the uh, the Bulls. This is going to be an interesting spot because Levine is out and they are taking on the San Antonio Spurs. The last time the Spurs and the Bulls played, I think the Spurs either won or they kept the game close. But I like the Bulls to... Uh, you know, get some re- redemption here. And I like them to bounce back. So I actually do like the Bulls tonight, minus four and a half at home against DeRozan's former team. And speaking of DeRozan, he's just on an incredible run right now. I know Levine being out is big, but with the way DeRozan's playing, 30 plus points per game, I think he's going to have another fantastic outing. And I can see the Bulls doing enough to cover this minus four and a half. So I like Chicago tonight. Yeah, I, I love that uh, shout there. And I'm trying to see his player prop tonight for points scored is set at 31 and a half. <laughs> That's a, I mean, that just That's a testament big. to how good he's playing. And with uh, Zach Levine being out tonight, you know the ball is going to be going through DeRozan's hand once again. He loves playing his former teams. So 31 and a half isn't unachievable. It's over right now. It's actually at minus 130. Wow. So if you were confident he was going to go under that mark, which is a high mark, it's at plus 105. So uh i don't know where i stand there to be honest i have DeRozan on my fantasy team so i'm just gonna stay out of this one yeah greg popovich i mean he's one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time i don't really like that player prop but hey i mean if he does score more than 30 it's definitely gonna help my chances at winning this uh the spread bet so yeah we'll see what happens there but that will conclude another great edition of toronto today here on the parlay thank you so much for listening and watching you can catch us wherever you find your favorite podcast make sure you follow us all over social media and mike and i will be back at it again tomorrow with another edition of the show take care everyone (laughs) 